one and all we are going to start with the subject titled analog circuits okay analog circuits it is common for both ec and double e stream electrical stream and electronic stream it is common a slight change in the syllabus compared to ec and double e but we'll cover the all the topics which are required for ec as well as what are the required for electrical and electronics both now the topics for this analog circuits are mainly it is divided into three parts diodes okay then transistors then operation amplifiers so we are going to start with the diodes first before going to see what are the topics that are there in the this analog circuits we are going to see diodes under the diodes we are going to see characteristics diode characteristics these diode characteristics are not there for the ec stream but it is there for the double e stream ec st stream students they are going to see study in edc subject okay but still it is required for the analog circuits that's why we are going to cover it in analog circuits for ec stream it uh, once again it will be covered in edc but double e people double e students there is no edc subject that's why we are going to start with the diode characteristics after that characteristics we are going for diode applications diode applications in the diode applications we are going to see rectifiers rectifiers clippers clampers rectifiers clippers clampers okay diode application first we are going to see diode characteristics then we are coming for the applications in applications we are starting with the rectifiers rectifiers once again here we are going to see rectifiers without filters rectifiers with filters rectifiers without filters and rectifiers with filters then comes clippers and clampers these clippers and clampers comes in the category of non linear wave shaping in your syllabus if you see it will be mentioned as non linear wave shaping if you see in the gate syllabus they will mention it as non linear wave shaping non linear wave shaping means is nothing but clippers and clampers this about the diode characteristics then comes transistors first we are going to see characteristics once again for double e stream characteristics has to be studied in analog circuits only but ec students this characteristics will be covered in edc also but this is required for the analog circuits that's why we are going to start with this characteristics also i will explain in analog circuits okay which is required for double e stream at any way that's why we are going to see characteristics of transistor once again here characteristics bipolar junction transistors field effect transistors in till gate 2015 gate syllabus till 2015 gate syllabus we are having only bjt and fet characteristics but the latest edition is in 2016 a small minor modifications are there compared to 2015 gate syllabus if you go through that one they are included mosfet characteristics also okay bjt characteristics jfet characteristics mosfet characteristics okay we are going to see next then comes amplifiers c amplifier c b amplifier c c amplifier all those three are called bjt amplifiers similarly common source fet amplifier common drain fet amplifier common gate fet amplifier 
those are fit amplifiers. Similarly, we have to study about the MOSFET amplifiers. That is the latest introduction. Okay. Previously, it's not the MOSFET amplifiers are not there in the gate syllabus. But this year onwards, it is introduced. MOSFET amplifiers is introduced. That's why we have to see the yet BJT amplifiers, JFET amplifiers, MOSFET amplifiers. We have to see. Before see this um, amplifiers, we have to go through the biasing. Biasing of BJT, biasing of FET. Okay, we have to see the biasing, then comes amplifiers. Here we are going to see BJT amplifiers, FET amplifiers, MOSFET amplifiers. Then comes multi stage amplifiers. Multi stage amplifiers. Here comes next frequency response. Frequency response of a single stage amplifier, frequency response of a multi stage amplifier. That we have to see under this frequency response of single stage amplifier, multi stage amplifier. The next one is feedback amplifiers. Feedback amplifiers. The next one is oscillators. oscillators. The last one is under the transistors is power amplifiers. Power amplifiers. So, starts with the transistors. We have to see first characteristics. Here transistors means bipolar junction transistors. Shortly pronounced as BJT, abbreviated as BJT. The next one is field effect transistor. Once again, field effect transistor, two types. Junction field effect transistor, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, abbreviated as MOSFET and JFET. So, we have to see the characteristics of these three transistors. Once the characteristics are over, we have to go for the biasing. After biasing, we have to come to the amplifiers. Next one is multi-stage amplifier. Then comes frequency response. Here frequency response of a single stage amplifier, then multi-stage amplifier. Next one is feedback amplifiers, oscillators, power amplifiers. This is the second category. Coming to third category, this considering this is first category of your syllabus, second category of that syllabus, the third one is category of that syllabus. The third one is operational amplifiers. Operational amplifiers. Here the operational amplifier we are going to see. Basics of operational amplifier. Basics of operational amplifier. Next comes applications of operational amplifier. Basics and applications of operational amplifier. It's looking like a only two topics, but it's a very lengthy one. Okay, applications. There are so many number of applications. Rectifiers are there. Operation rectifiers using operational amplifier. Filters using operational amplifier. Okay, multi vibrators using operational amplifier. Integrator, differentiator, adder, subtractor. Instrumentation amplifier, non-inverting amplifier, inverting amplifier, like this zero crossing detector, like this. The number of applications are so many. So, this is a very large topic. Okay, don't consider it's a small one. It requires a large number of classes, this. And one of the very, very, very important for the gate point of view. Okay, for a gate examination point of view, this carries very good marks. Then comes triple five timer. Okay. This is the last uh, triple five timer. Then comes linear wave shaping. Linear wave shaping. These are the topics that we are going to cover in the analog circuits. Once again, I will repeat. The starts with the diodes. 
under the diodes, we are going to see the characteristics of a diode. Then we are going to see some of the basics related to diodes which are required for the continuation in the amplifiers. And for doing problems, some of the basic theory is required that also we are going to cover in this basics and characteristics. Then comes diode applications. Applications of diode are rectifiers, clippers, clampers. Rectifiers, once again, without filters we are going to study, with filters we are going to study. Then comes to clippers and clampers, it is comes under the category of non-linear wave shaping. There is a one more thing, there is a linear wave shaping is also there, that we will see at the end. Okay. Then comes second one, transistors. Here we are going to see characteristics, biasing, amplifiers, multi-stage amplifiers, frequency response, for a single stage amplifier, for a multi stage amplifier we are going to see. Then comes feedback amplifiers, oscillators, power amplifiers. This comes under the category of transistors part. Then comes third one, operational amplifier. How an operational amplifier is constructed? Okay, what are the modes of operation of an operational amplifier? The characters, electrical characteristics of or electrical specifications of operational amplifier. Block diagram of operational amplifier. All these things we are going to see under the basics. Then comes applications. The applications of operational amplifier are very, very huge number. So we have to see maximum number of possible uh, applications on operational amplifier. Okay. Then comes to the great point of the weightage of marks. It's around, on an average we can expect around 10 marks. Sometimes it goes to 12 marks. Sometimes it comes to as minimum as 8 marks. That's why if you take an, an average, you are going to get 10 marks. Average I said. Sometimes it reaches to peak 12. Sometimes it comes to as low as 8 marks. Therefore, it's an, an average. We can take it as 10 marks. Comes to this one. How the weight is generally distributed? Operational amplifier, there is a one mark question and two mark question possible. There is a one, one mark question and two marks, one two marks question, most of the cases. Comes to here, under the diodes, we can expect one mark question or sometimes two marks question. Here it is and generally. Here, one mark question or two marks question. Comes to here characteristics, an amplifier, multi-stage amplifier, you can expect around two marks. Then comes frequency response, feedback amplifier, power amplifiers, you can expect two marks. This is minimum. So, two plus two, four, five, six, seven, 8, 9, okay, 8 R. That is minimum number, 8. Now sometimes there may be a 2, two marks questions, 1, 1 mark, then it comes to 5. Otherwise here 1 mark question and 2 marks question. That's, and then I, I take in worst case, it's around 8 marks we are getting. So more than that one, sometimes you will get 12 marks also. Okay. So these are the topics we are going to see under analog circuits. So today we are going to start with the diodes. Okay. For this diodes, some of the basic concepts are required in a semiconductor physics. That we are going to see initially, then we will come to the diode. Okay. Now we are going to start with the basics of a diodes. Based on the conductivity 
based on the conductivity, materials are classified into three categories. First one is conductors. Second one is insulators. Third one is semiconductors. Based on the conductivity, electrical conductivity, materials are classified into three categories. The first one is conductors. That means they will conduct current heavily because their number of free electrons available are huge number. Therefore, at room temperature also there exists a current. Okay. Examples for conductors are all the metals. All metals come from the category of this conductors. Insulators, second one. They will not conduct electricity. Why they will not conduct electricity? Because there are no free electrons available in the conduction band. There are no free electrons available in the conduction band. Therefore, current is zero. Therefore, they are called insulators. Examples for insulators are so many are there. Example, wood, diamond, plastic, etc. But for us, important one is semiconductors. Semiconductor, the name itself suggests semiconductor. That means whose conductivity is less than conductors, greater than insulators. That means its average its conduct. Some electricity is going to conduct, uh, exists in semiconductors, but it is not equal to the conductors. They are semiconductors whose conductivity of electricity lies between conductors and insulators. Once again I am repeating, semiconductors conductivity lies between conductors and insulators. Entire electronics deals with the semiconductors whose conductivity lies between conductors and insulators. Examples for semiconductors are silicon and germanium. Silicon and germanium are examples for semiconductors. Next one is they are insulators at room temperature. Semiconductors are insulators at room temperature. Or we can say at absolute, not at room temperature, we can take it at, at absolute zero. At absolute zero degrees. Okay? Because there are no free electrons available for the conductivity. That's why semiconductors are acts as insulators at absolute zero degree Kelvin. Okay? That's equals to minus 273 degree centigrade. Now comes why they are insulator, they will act as insulator at semiconductors. For that purpose, we have to go for the crystal structure. Crystal structure of a silicon or germanium, both are same. Okay? Either crystal, uh, sorry, either silicon or germanium is having how many valence electrons? Four valence electrons. Silicon or germanium comes under the category of fourth group elements. Fourth group element means the outer shell contains four valence electrons. That is, if you are taking it as a silicon, take, forget about the inner shells, we are considering the outer shell, this is the one electron, this is the second electron, third electron, fourth electron. Four valence electrons are exist available in a silicon. But, for stability purpose, how many valence electrons are required? Eight valence electrons are required. But silicon or germanium is having only four valence electrons. Therefore, it has to form a covalent bond with the neighboring silicon atoms. Therefore, if you go for the crystal structure, it looks like, like this. Therefore, we are going for a crystal structure of a silicon.
take it as a silicon we are representing four valence electrons like this since electrons are having negative charge we are represented exclusively in external therefore we, it's a we are indicating internally plus 4 such that this plus 4 and electrons four electrons are having negative charge therefore it's a neutral <coughs> that is silicon atom is neutral that total positive charge equals to total negative charge for indication we have shown four valence electrons exclusively outside that means electrons are having negative charge so negative 4 we have shown that's why here we are indicating plus 4 so that it is a neutral one so it forms a covalent bond with the neighboring silicon atoms therefore 1 2 3 4 like this 1, 2, 3, 4. I am not indicating plus 4, plus 4 here. Default assume that here there is a plus 4 is there because for the this one I have shown this is applicable for all the silicon atoms I have not shown okay assume it is existed here plus 4 here plus 4 like that so what is going to happen these are going to form a covalent bonds like this So this is going to form a covalent bond with the neighboring one which is, which is not shown but it's a three dimensional view assume it is existed okay therefore it's going to form a covalent bond it's going to form a covalent bond it's going to form a covalent bond with the neighboring these things like this now check it any free electron available in this figure it's not a free, free one, it's not a free one, it's not a free one, it is not a free one. They also formed a covalent bond with the next one. Since it's a three-dimensional one, we are not able to show the entire one. We are assuming it's it's formed. This is formed with the neighboring one, this is formed with the neighboring one. Okay, like this it's going to form here, like this it is going to form, like this it is going to form. Therefore, all the valence electrons forms a covalent bond with the neighboring valence electrons. So that, now see here, this silicon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 valence electrons are there. For stability purposes, 8 valence electrons are required. Therefore, it is guarded. Therefore, it is a stable one. <coughs> Similarly, this silicon, check it. One, here one more thing will be there. It's not displayed. Two, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So if you take any silicon atom, all these electrons form a covalent bonds, valence electrons form a covalent bonds, therefore no free electron available, therefore conductivity is 0 at, okay, 0 degree Kelvin, that is minus 273 degrees centigrade, absolute 0. Clear? Therefore, conductivity or what we I said one statement previously at zero degree Kelvin, semiconductors are acts as insulators. Since there are no free electron available, which is responsible for conductivity, therefore there is no current existed. Hence, they will act as insulators at zero degree Kelvin. Now, as temperature is increased, what is going to happen? As temperature is increased, what is going to happen? Some of the covalent bonds will get the energy. From where they are getting the energy? From the temperature. That is called thermal energy. Thermal energy. 
these valence electrons, some of the valence electrons will acquire the energy from the apply, uh, external temperature that is called thermal energy. By etching the thermal energy, some of the covalent bonds may be broken. Let us suppose this is broken. Now what is going to happen? This covalent bond is broken means, let us suppose it moved to here. It is moved to here means it becomes, let us suppose, hole. Sorry, that is electron. Here hole will be created. Here hole will be created. Here electron will be generated. Similarly, this covalent bond is broken. Assume this becomes whole, there is a free electron generated. So, if you break a covalent bond, if you break a covalent bond, whole, this is called whole, this is called free electron. Whole electron pair is generated if you break the covalent bond. As the temperature goes on increasing, more number of covalent bonds are acquiring the energy, then they are going to break the covalent bonds, becoming free electron hole pair is generated. Now in this figure, how many holes are there? This is one hole, this is second hole, therefore the number of holes are two, number of electrons are two, therefore here number of holes is equals to number of electrons. Number of holes equals to number of electrons. This, this is called intrinsic semiconductor. Intrinsic semiconductor. Or it is also called as pure semiconductor. Silicon and germanium are called intrinsic semiconductor or pure semiconductor. Why it is called pure semiconductor means we have not added any impurities. That we will see what is meant, what is meant by impurity, why we have to add impurities, what is the purpose, all these things we will see one by one. But pure semiconductor or intensive semiconductor, this is, is called, so called. That is, example for intensive semiconductor, either silicon or germanium. In silicon and germanium or in intensive semiconductor, number of holes equals to number of electrons. Clear till that one? Now there is, I am going to give another important one. This is a electron. This is also electron. What is the difference between this electron and this electron? This is valence electron. This is free electron. This is called, this, 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 all these are called valence electrons. They are not responsible for the conductivity. Valence electrons are not responsible for conductivity. If you are having 100 valence electrons or 200 valence electrons or 50 valence electrons, conductivity is nil. Because conductivity depends on the free electrons. If you are having valence electrons, simply it is not no use. You have to give it the energy so that that valence electrons becomes a free electron, then only conductivity existed. Therefore, here one free electron is there. there these two as well as these holes, this hole and this hole are responsible for the conductivity. Free electrons, holes are responsible for conductivity. Valence electrons are not responsible for the conductivity. That's one of the very, very, very important points. An intensive semiconductor number of electrons is equals to number of holes. That is positive charge equals to negative charge. Therefore, an intensive semiconductor is electrically neutral or not? Intensive semiconductor is electrically neutral. Because total positive charge equals to total negative charge. Therefore, it is electrically neutral. Now comes, yeah, what is the disadvantage of intensive semiconductor? The number of charge carriers, free ca charge carriers, which are responsible for the conductivity are very small in number. Very small. Therefore, conductivity is less. That's why generally intensive semiconductor we are not going to use. Okay, as it is. We are adding the impurities. So, for intrinsic semiconductor, 
for in, take an intensive semiconductor add impurities add impurities okay then it becomes extrinsic semiconductor i will explain okay intensive semiconductor example is silicon or germanium intensive semiconductor is also called pure semiconductor in this one number of holes equals to number of electrons that is total positive charge equals to total negative charge therefore it is electrically neutral in intensive semiconductor the total concentration that is number of electrons plus number of holes is equals to very small in number therefore conductivity is very less conductivity is very less means there is no use that's why we are not using intrinsic semiconductor nothing but silicon and germanium as it is we are not going to use we are adding the impurities to the intrinsic semiconductor so that conductivity is increased and the number of applications are increased so take an intrinsic semiconductor intrinsic semiconductor plus add impurities it becomes extrinsic semiconductor take an intrinsic semiconductor example silicon or germanium take the silicon or germanium add impurities then it becomes extrinsic semiconductor what are the impurities that can be added either fifth group elements or third group elements fifth group elements or third group elements take a silicon add fifth group element or third group element it becomes an extrinsic semiconductor example for fifth group semi fifth group elements are that means what is meaning of fifth group valence shell contains five valence electrons or five electrons five valence electrons has to be available in the outer shell example phosphorus arsenic antimony and bismuth but generally we will not use antimony bismuth and arsenic mostly we will use phosphorus only if we add intrinsic semiconductor plus fifth group element then the resulting semiconductor is called n type semiconductor n type semiconductor if we add third group elements boron aluminum gallium indium then the resulting one is called p type semiconductor p type semiconductor that means take an intrinsic semiconductor add phosphorus or arsenic or antimony generally preferable one is phosphorus the resulting semiconductor is called n type semiconductor take either silicon or germanium add either boron aluminum or gallium or indium the resulting semiconductor is called p type semiconductor is generally most preferable one is boron clear that means there are two types of extrinsic semiconductors one is n type semiconductor the other one is p type semiconductor now we are adding impurities the process of adding impurities is called doping the process of adding impurities is called doping now what is the need for adding do impurities to increase conductivity to increase conductivity to increase conductivity we are adding the impurities the process of adding impurities is called doping now we'll go for the n type semiconductor first then we'll go for the p type semiconductor this becomes basics for the semi diode so once it is clear then we'll start with the diodes
10 टाइप सेमीकंडक्टर सो व्हाट टाइप ऑफ इंप्योरिटीज वी आर एडिंग फिफ्थ ग्रुप एलिमेंट फास्फरस टेक फास्फरस फास्फरस इज हैविंग फाइव वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स ओके दिस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स नाउ आई एम रिप्रेजेंटिंग लाइक दिस थ्री फोर फाइव फाइव वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स सो फाइव आई एम रिप्रेजेंटिंग प्लस फाइव सो दैट इट बिकम्स न्यूट्रल and the number of impurities added are very very small compared to silicon concentration or germanium concentration the number of impurities are added are very very small therefore the central element silicon is replaced by a phosphorus the neighboring is having silicon only Now this forms covalent bond. This forms covalent bonds like this. Now, see here, out of five valence electrons of the phosphorus, only four forms a covalent bond, whereas the fifth one is, now is a valence electron or free electron? Still, it is valence electron only. Now, the amount of energy required to make this electron as a free electron is very, very, very small. that is equals to 0.05 electron volt if it is a silicon 0.01 electron volt if it is a germanium the amount of energy required to make this electron as a free electron is very very small value therefore that value is 0.05 electron volt for a silicon 0.01 electron volt for a germanium so this immediately becomes a free electron therefore this is a free electron now how many free electrons are available one how many holes are there now here hole will not be created that's important point here hole is not created when hole will be created if you break the covalent bond and the valence electron becomes a free electron then hole will be created the fifth unattached electron by becoming a free electron hole will not be created therefore right now number of free electrons are one number of holes are zero now that's it. immediately it's very very minimum temperature not minimum negligible temperature it is sufficient to make this coal and this electron as a free electron now what is going to happen at room temperature at room temperature means the required uh, temperature is increased to 27 degrees centigrade so temperature is increasing means some we are increasing we are giving the thermal energy some of the covalent bonds are broken this covalent bond is broken assume this covalent bond also broken this electron becomes a free electron then here hole will be generated since its covalent bond is broken now free electron hole pair is generated this is hole this is 
free electron. Now how many free electrons are there? Two. How many holes are there? One. Next I said this also covalent bond is broken. Let us suppose this becomes free electron. A hole is generated. This is hole. Now see how many electrons are there? One, two, three. How many holes are there? One, two. So in n type semiconductor, number of electrons, number of electrons are more than number of holes. That means these are called, electrons are called majority charge carriers. Majority charge carriers. Electrons are called majority charge carriers. Holes are called minority charge carriers. Okay? So in n type semiconductor, number of electrons are more than number of holes because this is the explanation and majority charge carriers are electrons, minority charge carriers are holes. Clear till that one? Now comes, electrons are having more number, holes are having less number. If you take overall, I have taken only 9 atoms. 9, but if you take 10 power 28 atoms, then oh, so it's so much difference will be there. Now my question is, electrons are having negative charge, holes are having positive charge. That means n-type semiconductor is electrically negative. Is it correct answer? Is it correct answer? Electrons are having negative charge, holes are having positive charge. Number of electrons are more than number of holes. That means more negative charge compared to more positive charge. Therefore, an n-type semiconductor is electrically negative or not? No. It is electrically neutral. N-type semiconductor is also electrically neutral. How we are going to say it is electrically neutral? See here, negative, number of electrons are more means negative charge is more. But the thing is, what this L phosphorus atom donated this electron or not. Here covalent bond broken is different one. Whereas here it is without creating hole, this electron become a free electron. Without creating hole. It's donated one electron. Donated one electron or accepted one electron. It becomes, an atom becomes ion. Okay. Therefore, the phosphorus becomes ion. Phosphorus becomes an ion and it is donated one electron. It is donated one electron. Therefore, it becomes a positive ion. It is becomes a positive ion. Now, see here number of holes. One, where is another number of uh, second hole? This one, two holes plus Ion also having, this ion also having positive one charge. So, 1, 2, 3 positive charge. 1, 2, 3 free electrons. Electrons are having negative charge. So, overall n-type semiconductor is electrically neutral because there is a concept of ions comes into the picture. By donating one electron, the phosphorus atom becomes a positive ion. This is having a positive charge. Therefore, holes are having positive charge. Overall, total positive charge is equals to total negative charge is applicable for an n-type semiconductor also. So, n-type semiconductor contains majority charge carriers, electrons, minority charge carriers, holes, and a positive ions and positive ions in its structure. The next one is P-type semiconductor.
pre type semiconductor in this pre type semiconductor take a silicon or germanium at trivalent impurities trivalent means third group elements okay example boron it is having only three valence electrons so i am representing it as three valence electrons it is surrounded by silicon atoms who silicon atoms are having four valence electrons therefore i am representing it as silicon Boron is having only three valence electrons, so three covalent bonds are broken. like this but it is not formed any covalent bond see there is no electron valence electron available for break, uh, making a covalent bond so what it is what it is is going to do immediately there is a strong tendency that it will pull up one valence electron from some, somewhere neighboring some covalent bond let us suppose it's attracted and it strongly there is a strong force that it will attract this one so it, be, it it will come here then a hole is created so there is a strong tendency that it will attract one electron from the neighboring one so therefore it's attracted means hole is generated this it goes here now electron hole pair is not generated this electron goes here electron absence is assumed as hole now how many holes are there one hole how many electrons are there zero now increase temperature at room temperature some of the covalent bonds are broken therefore this electron moves here it becomes a free electron therefore hole is generated this is free electron this is hole let us suppose this also becomes free electron assume hole is generated now one two holes how many electrons one electron another electron there is a third hole is here so in p type semiconductor number of holes greater than number of electrons number of holes greater than number of electrons therefore holes are called majority charge carriers majority charge carriers electrons are called minority charge carriers electrons are minority charge carriers therefore final one in p type semiconductor majority charge carriers are holes minority charge carriers are electrons now holes are having a positive charge electrons are having a negative charge therefore p type semiconductor is electrically positive once again this is a wrong concept p type semiconductor is also electrically neutral why this boron atom attracted one electron 
that means it's accepted one electron it's accepted one electron means it's accepted it becomes a negative ion it becomes a negative ion therefore here ions will be added that means this boron is having becomes a negative ion now see here negative charge carriers 1 2 3 holes 1 2 3 so total positive charge is equals to total negative charge therefore and p type semiconductor is also electrically Therefore, an p-type semiconductor is also electrically neutral. It contains holes, electrons plus negative ions. So, in a p-type semiconductor, we will have holes, electrons and negative ions. So, in n-type semiconductor, holes, electrons and positive ions. In p-type semiconductor, holes, electrons, negative ions. Okay, now we'll, we'll proceed for a break. After break, we'll continue this one. Okay.
Yeah, we'll take up the questions. Okay, first question. It's a Bharat. Best book to study beginners to study analog circuits. Okay, the textbook is once again it's a combination of three four subjects. In engineering, it's a combination of three four subjects coming together becomes a one uh, area, analog area. Now the textbooks for this diodes, transistors. For a diodes and transistors, you can go for Milman and Halkias. Electronic devices and circuits by Milman and Halkias. Electronic devices and circuits by Milman and Halkias. There is a one more textbook, Integrated Electronics by same authors. Integrated Electronics by Milman and Halkias. Or Electronic devices and circuits by Milman Halkias. There is one more textbook, electronic device by Sedra and Smith. Sedra and Smith. That's also a good book. That's about the, whatever I said, some part. Coming to linear wave shaping, clippers, clampers. That is clippers, clampers, linear wave shaping. Pulse and digital circuits by Millman and Taub. Pulse and digital circuits by Millman and Taub. Then comes another one, operational amplifier. For operational amplifier, you, I am referring Rai Choudhury. You can go through Rai Choudhury or Ramakant, Guaycard, some textbook. So if you go for the electronic device, the for rectifiers, diodes, we can go for Milman Alkias, integrated electronics or electronic device and circuits. Then comes some portion that is clippers, clampers, pulse and digital circuits by Milman and Top. Operational amplifier by Roy Chaudhary. Okay. These are the best books as of my knowledge. I am preferring, I am referring from these books. Second question. It is from Ishan. Can you explain conductors and insulators on based on the atomic structure? Can you explain the conductors and the insulators on the base? Same, it's okay, repeated. Also explain semiconductor in the form of atomic structure. Atomic structure in the sense, I can't get that question exactly. What is meaning of atomic structure? We can go for a energy band diagram wise. Instead of atomic structure, atomic structure means it's a group, uh, this thing, uh, groups. For first group, second group, third group, fourth group, fifth group, they based on the number of valence electrons, they are divided that into group structure. But coming to the how they are classified means that based on the energy band diagram. This is valence band, this is conduction band, this is called forbidden energy gap. For con insulators, this gap is very large. It's approximately 6 electron volts. Now what is this meaning of this valence band, conduction band, forbidden energy gap? The valence electron, this electron, this electron, this electron, this electron will be in this energy levels. Whereas this free electron, free electron, there is one more free electron. Okay, where is that free electron? Somewhere. Free, this free electron, this free electron, this free electron, those free electrons energy levels will be here. That means free electrons will be here, valence electrons are here. So if we give this much of energy to valence electron, it becomes free electron. How much energy you have to give? This much of energy, let us suppose it equals to 10 electron volts. If you give 10 electron volts to the valence electrons, it becomes free electron. That is indication of forbidden energy gap. Clear? So, whereas insulators, this is very large. Six electron volts is very large. If you give that much energy, the, the atom itself destroys. Therefore, it cannot withstand that much energy, so it is not going to exist. Whereas, this forbidden energy gap is one electron, approximately around one electron volt for a semiconductor. That means a small one electron volt energy is very small at room temperature itself it can acquire some number of uh, electrons can acquire the energy it becomes free electron. So conductivity existed at room temperature. Coming to 
semiconductors both conduction band and valence band are overlapped with each other there is no concept of uh, valence electron free electron all electrons are free electrons so conductivity is very more very large clear like the based on the energy band diagram they can be classified next question is from Shik shakti prasad please kindly explain the necessity of a semiconductor over conductor when a semiconductor acts as a conductor and when acts as an insulator yes please explain the necessity of semiconductor over conductor clear that point now the question conductor conductivity is very large yes we cannot control the conductivity whereas in semiconductor conductivity can be controlled by us by adding the impurities by adding the number of impurities, we can control the conductivities in our hand. But in semiconductors, sorry, in conductor there is no concept. Their conductivity is always very large. We cannot control that conductivity. Whereas in semiconductor, we can control by adding the conduct, uh, impurities or by increasing the temperature, nothing but by giving the energy. That's okay. So we can controlling is possible in semiconductor, whereas in condu conductor controlling is not possible. Shakti Prasad, clear? Next, when a semiconductor acts as an insulator and when it acts as a conductor. A semiconductor acts as a insulator if there are no free electrons. If there are more number of free electrons, it becomes a conductor. It acts as a conductor. It's not conductor in the sense, don't assume that conductivity is nearer to the metals. Conductivity is larger. Now, at, uh, at what time it will act as an insulator? That's already explained. Once again, at 0 degree Kelvin, that's absolute 0. No free electrons available. So, it acts as an insulator at 0 degree Kelvin. If you increase the temperature, some of the covalent bonds are broken, electron hole pair is generated, therefore conductivity existed. So as the temp energy goes on increasing, conductivity goes on increasing. Clear Shakti Prasad? Fourth question. Ishan, can you please explain in detail concept of electron and hole in terms of atomic model? This is called valence electrons. These valence electrons are attached to the nucleus force. They will not move from one place to other place. So, no, when conduct current will be existed if electron is going to move from one place to another place. When electron can move from one place to another place if it becomes a free electron. When it becomes a free electron, if you give sufficient energy to this valence electron, so it comes out of the nucleus force of silicon. It has to overcome the for nucleus force of the silicon, then it becomes a free electron. That means it comes here like this. It becomes free electron. Absence of electron will be treated as whole. Clear? So, valence electron means it, it has to be in outer shell. It is under the nucleus force. Con current will not be existed by the electrons valence electron. Once if you give sufficient energy, it becomes a free electron, current, current is going to exist. Can you please explain in detail concept of electron and hole? Clear now? Hole how it is created? If you break the covalent bond, then electron, free electron hole pair is generated. Sail, next question is Sailabala Soren. Sorry, Sailabala Soren. How does phosphorus not creating hole even it provides one electron? That's okay. Can you please repeat once more? Okay, it's repeating. Take this as same example phosphorus, it is having five valence electrons. Out of these five valence electrons, it's only formed a four covalent bonds. Four valence electrons forms a covalent bonds with the four. But fifth one is not a, it's not formed any covalent bond. It's a free electron, it's valence electron still now. And it is not under, or uh, it's not formed any covalent bond. It's not formed any covalent bond. Now, when this, if you break this covalent bond, if you move this one, this free electron whole pair is generated. 
whereas if this moving becomes a free electron and it disappears. So, electron hole pair will be generated if you break the covalent bond. And if you are not breaking the covalent bond, hole will not be created. Valence electron becomes a free electron if you give some small energy. But if you break the covalent bond, electron hole pair is generated. Clear? Now we will carry on with the next one, next topic. We have seen p-type semiconductor and n-type semiconductor. Now we are going for a next concept diode. It is nothing but a p-n junction diode.